Welcome, everyone. I'm Sue Barber, author, former IT director for a Fortune 500 company, turn executive coach, and this is the Visibility Factor Podcast, where we explore how to raise your visibility and play bigger at work and in life. We'll explore key topics and welcome guests that help you shift your thinking about yourself so you can see new possibilities for your leadership. I'm on a mission to create a visibility movement for leaders to show their value and be seen for their true talent. Are you ready to take the next step towards a higher level of visibility for yourself? Let's go. Today's episode of the Visibility Factor podcast is brought to you by Amplify You, the ultimate program designed to unleash your full potential and amplify your success. Imagine having a personal coach cheering you on, guiding you through a journey of self-discovery and helping you break free from those limiting beliefs that have been holding you back. That's exactly what Amplify You is all about. Whether you're a leader now or aspiring to be one, this program is your ticket to a more confident, empowered you. It's like having a supportive friend in your corner encouraging you to dream big. It's about having the career success that you want and creating a life you truly deserve. Amplify You offers a unique experience to help you build the confidence to tackle any challenge life throws your way. If you're interested in learning more about the program, please visit susanmbarber.com and click on the menu item, Programs. Are you ready to transform your life and your career? Let's make it happen. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Visibility Factor podcast. This is Sue Barber, your host. I am thrilled today to bring you my guest, Marsha Dalwood, who is an angel investor. She has a new book coming out. She's done some amazing things in her career that are so impressive, and I can't wait for you to meet her and learn from her. Marsha, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Sue, for having me. Oh, I would love to have you do an introduction of yourself and share with everyone some of the things that you've been doing, which I know you have even more coming up, but share what you've done so far. Sure. So uh, for many, many years, I worked in corporate America and I started to feel like I wasn't really making a lot of progress. I couldn't see the forest through the trees. I was going to meetings. We were having the same conversations, thinking something was going to change and it just wasn't changing. Uh, And then one day my husband came home and said, hey, we got invited to an angel investing meeting. And I said, what's that? I thought maybe you go and pick stocks together or something. I had no idea. This was in 2012. And so we went to the meeting and we lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the time. And I was just fascinated at how much innovation was happening right in my own backyard. I thought that you had to be living in Silicon Valley or be some big entrepreneur that nobody could really ever invest in or ever ever talk to. And I realized that there's innovation and entrepreneurship happening in every city and every town all across the country. And I just became so amazed at the things that were happening. I was so used to working in my job and, you know, hearing the same thing all the time. And then I'm going to these meetings and I'm learning about this technology and that innovation and that type of healthcare expansion. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is like so amazing. So I kept going to the meetings and I would be asked to be on what's called a diligence team. That's where you would do a deeper dive into what the company was really doing before you made a final investment. So I got to learn more about it. I thought, well, I don't really know how to do this. You know, this isn't maybe for me, but um, I learned really fast. And there were a lot of people around me who had done it before and they would help me learn. And so over time, I just thought it was just really fun and wanted to do more of it. Well, fast forward about two years into it, I, we moved and now lived in New York City. So I thought, whoa, there's gonna be all kinds of really cool things happening in New York City, which there are. But I also learned very quickly that how little funding goes to women or people of color. And then I my eyes really opened up to, wow, this is this is something that we need to start to change. So less than 3% of funding goes to women, less than 1% goes to people of color, and if you're a woman of color, forget it, you probably aren't getting anything or very little. But there's amazing things happening and amazing inventions and innovations that are happening and people of all looks and and sizes and shapes are all making these incredible uh, innovations and that we need to see them in the world. Oh, I loved all that. I remember hearing you start to talk about this and I was thrilled because I didn't know much about it either. So <laughs> I'm so glad you're here to like start to open people's eyes to what's possible. I know that you and I had a conversation before we you know, met about a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about how people can do this 
in a way that doesn't require, you know, millions of dollars to invest. They can do it in smaller amounts. Can you talk a little bit about how that can happen for people and what they should do? Sure. I mean, I always thought this is just for the rich and the well-connected. Like, I didn't think I could do it. And even when we went to our first meeting and I was hearing the minimums, um, you know, a lot of angel groups back in the day, the minimums were, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. And I thought, oh dear, you know, that that's going to be very hard to do and build a portfolio. It would take years and years and years and it maybe even not ever happen because it just was way too much money. But a lot of things have changed in the last 10 years. And one of the biggest things that makes you, let's say, a little bit more successful in angel investing is to diversify because there are going to be companies that go out of business. You know, uh, startups are very delicate. (laughs) They're new companies. They're trying to grow. They're trying to scale. The biggest reason that they don't make it is because they run out of money. And, you know, that's why I'm a proponent on having there be, you know, just more investors. So a couple of years ago, funds became more accessible. So a fund is when you make one investment and then there's a manager who will take that money and invest it into multiple companies, sometimes as many as 10 or even 15 companies. So I thought, wow, that's a cool idea. So now I can take, you know, what would have been, you know, enough to put into just one company, I could take that same amount of money and put it into a fund. And now I have this diversified portfolio. So the chances of me losing all that money is very low compared to what it would have been if I was just making these one-off investments. So that's one thing. But the bigger thing is in 2016, the Securities and Exchange Commission changed some of the rules based on the Jobs Act so that people can invest through what's called equity crowdfunding. And you can invest for as little as $50 on an equity crowdfunding site. There are three that kind of have the market share right now. And uh, you can go on, you can find a company. And, you know, most of the time, the minimum investment is more like $100 or $150. Um, But, you know, it's much, much more approachable than having to put up thousands and thousands of dollars. So how does, can I just ask a little deeper on that? So if I go and invest $150 in a company, what does that give me? Does that give me the opportunity to have a voice in terms of what they move forward on? Is there a voting process or how does that work once you do that? Um, Usually within equity crowdfunding, you do get a small piece of ownership into the company or a small piece of a promise of ownership into the company because in a lot of cases, these are like promissory notes type things. Um, But you absolutely do not have a say in anything that the company is doing. The only people that would really have a say would be, you know, major, major investors who are sitting on the board or something like that. However, Um, many of the companies that are fundraising through an equity crowdfunding platform are typically, not all the time, but they can be a consumer product, meaning that you could be a customer as well as an investor. And I think this is pretty cool because then you do have some power, which is that you can become their customer and you can help other people become their customer. And then that helps the business to grow. So it's a, I think equity crowdfunding can be great for awareness and also to allow people to kind of dip their toe in the water and get to know a little bit more about this. The equity crowdfunding sites are, are heavily regulated, meaning that all of the information has to be on the site. So the CEO can't go to you, Sue, and tell you something about the company and then come and tell me something that they didn't tell you. Everything has to be disclosed and communicated through the site. So if I went to the CEO and I said, hey, I have a question, they would say, okay, that's fine. But you have to ask the question on the site so that Sue can see it too and everybody else. So I like that because then um, as people are reading you know, all the materials and they're looking through the Q&A, they can get a real sense of what the company is about and what their wow. goals are. So fascinating. I feel like this is a hidden world. I had no, no I know that's what I felt like, like too when I learned about it. Information about it. Uh, well, you have done some really impressive things uh, that you didn't really share, a lo- you know, in your past. And I would just love to hear how that happened for you. So like you were in the SEC Small Business Committee. You've done things um, in terms of like Angel Capital Association, Mindshift Capital, Golden Seeds. You've done a lot of amazing things. What advice would you give someone else who might be interested in getting further involved in things like this that you've been a part of? 
Yeah, I certainly didn't expect to all of a sudden have, you know, all of these things that I was involved in related to angel investing. So I started in 2012. I literally didn't even know what the meeting was about. Move forward to 2015, I was asked to be on the board of the Angel Capital Association, which is basically the professional association in the U.S. for angel investors. It's probably the biggest association of angel investors in the world. We do have some global members as well. And then in 2021, I ended up chairing the board for uh, a two-year term. And then from there, I was asked to be on uh, the SEC's Advisory Committee for Small Business Capital Formation, where I serve there now. So it certainly wasn't expected. Um, It was kind of one of those things that like, hey, uh, you know, you're interested in this and we know you and, you know, now you can do this. And then the next thing, next thing, next thing keeps happening. So, but it's been really cool. Uh, One of the things that I always tell people is, you know, my husband plays a lot of golf and there were times that he would come home and he would tell me about the people that he was playing golf with. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm not, and cause you know, we had had our fair share of like discussions about golf, right. And how much time it takes. Why doesn't it take the same amount of time as a yoga class? You know, I could go on and on. And, but I started to realize that I was actually jealous. I was jealous that he was meeting people and getting to know people that he would have never normally gotten to meet, but it was all because of golf. And I thought to myself, well, I don't want to play golf, no interest. Um, But how can I find a golf course? And that's what angel investing is. I started to meet people that I would have never normally met, but we had a common interest now and we had something common to work on and we were helping an entrepreneur, we were helping a small company. And to me, that was just like so incredible to be able to do that and then be able to um, possibly, you know, have a financial reward as well as all the emotional rewards that go with it. I mean, it's a great example of finding something that you have passion for, getting involved in it, and it opens right. up doors to opportunities and meeting people that you just probably never would have met <laughs> had you not gone to that first meeting. Exactly. So that's really impressive. I would love to understand a little bit more about your book. Your book is coming out in September. Yes. It's called Do Good While Doing Well. And I know that you're trying to open up information for people to help them understand more about angel investing and all of that. But I'd love to hear who is the book for and what are you really hoping that they'll learn by reading it? Yeah, so I wrote the book because I literally just got tired of watching companies, you know, run out of money and not be able to move forward and thinking to myself, well, I don't personally have the kind of wealth that I could just keep writing checks and keep writing checks. Um, so what, what can I do? And, and I would talk to people and they'd be like, oh, that, that sounds really cool. Angel investing, you know, I, I don't know anything about it and I don't think I could do it. And I'd be like, well, why don't you think you can do it? Oh, that's only for rich people. And that's only for people who know a lot and that you have to have, you know, a lot of education around it. And actually none of that is true. So there are a lot of myths out there. And while Shark Tank is a great show, um, we've invested in companies that ended up going on Shark Tank and, and it's great, especially for marketing. Um, but it does give the perception to people that you have to have a private plane or be Mark Cuban or something like that in order to, um, invest. And, you know, there's all these myths out there. What I'm trying to do is say, Hey, you can do good and go and help some of these companies that are doing amazing things. I mean, there are people working on everything from treatments for cancer and all kinds of other ailments, um, things to make, you know, your workflow and your workday better, things that can help children to learn. All of these amazing things are happening out there, but it's just, there's not enough capital flowing to those companies, especially to the underrepresented founders. So I thought to myself, well, what can I do? Because I, unless, unless I just kept buying lottery tickets and hoping I'd win so that I could, you know, give all the money away to uh, entrepreneurs, which I would totally do. Um, what can I do as one person? And then I thought, well, I, so I ended up doing um, a talk at TEDx Charlotte in 2022. And from that, people would watch the talk and they would say, 
well, we're inspired. We want to do something now. What do we do? And I would say, oh, yes, that's hard to explain in 11 minutes. So, you know, maybe a book would be helpful with a workbook and, you know, some exercises that you do make it really simple. But it needs to feel a little bit more approachable. In some cases, it just seems like, oh my gosh, I'd have to read financial and legal documents. And what if I don't understand those? And I don't want to make it an investment decision and look stupid or look like I don't know what I'm doing. So, you know, there's a lot of... Um, stigma around the word investing or, and how we approach it and even how we approach money. And we're starting to talk a little bit more about that. You're starting to see more books on the subject and things like that. But I really wanted people to feel like this is something that's doable that I can try. And you know what? You don't even have to try with money. What you can do is try with your time. Like if you wanted to help a company because you have a specific skill and it could be anything, I'm talking like maybe you worked in HR, maybe you know bookkeeping, or maybe you can help with some technology type things. I don't know. Startups need all kinds of help. Even if you just wanted to be a shoulder to cry on, you don't have to be, have a therapy degree or anything like that. You can literally just be like a cheerleader and a shoulder to cry. And you could just sit there and listen as the CEO is complaining about, you know, all of the crazy things that happen in startup world. And you can just sit there and nod and say, I understand. <laughs> like all of those things are very, very helpful to startups. So sometimes people start by just watching what's happening with companies and and using a little bit of their time to help some of these companies get off the ground. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you, I knew that you and I had talked about ways to invest your time versus if you don't have the money, that there are things that are needed by these companies that you might have the skill set or the experience in that they would probably love to have. If someone wants to do that, what's the best way for them to do that? Is that to reach out to companies that they know might need help? Or is there a place to go where you can, I don't know, volunteer your time? Yeah, that that's always a little bit of a tricky question, only from the standpoint that you're not going to really know the companies that are going to need the help. Because in a lot of cases, the companies aren't saying, hey, I need a cheerleader or a shoulder to cry on kind of thing. <laughs> um, however, uh, if you go to any type of a startup event that is happening in your in your town, so you could literally just go to Google and type in startup events in and then just fill in wherever you live. And it could be a big city, a small town, it doesn't matter there will likely be something. There's some kind of entrepreneurial activity happening. And if you just started to go and talk to people and meet people very quickly, if you have the desire, the people, all of the things will come and it'll all kind of fall together. Okay. So one of the things that I love that you're doing is a documentary that you're working on a film and it's called Show Her the Money. And I watched the trailer and it's so impressive honestly, just the conversations in that small amount of time in the trailer that were had around helping people, talking about the importance of investing in women, talking about the messaging, you know, just as you kind of referred to here around money stories that many women grew up with. So I'd love to have you share a little bit more about that when it's coming out. Um, I think it's going to be an amazing show. Yeah. So uh, it's really, it's a great, great film. Um, I was asked toward the end of the making of the film if I wanted to be what's considered an associate producer or basically an investor in the film. And I was lucky enough to be able to get in and a couple of my angel friends got in with me. And um, the film is on what we call our 50 city tour right now. Although I don't know at the end of the, by the end of 2024, it could be more than 50 cities. It started at the beginning of the year. And what we really been trying to do is bring awareness to the film through events. So what happens sometimes with films is, and I'm learning a lot about this because I knew nothing about it before last year, um, is that if you all of a sudden put a film out and it goes right to streaming, let's say it's on YouTube or Netflix or whatever it is, it has its moment in the sun, like it's 15 minutes of fame, and then it kind of dies out. And this is such an important topic. And it's really, the film was made to bring awareness to this problem that we didn't feel that that was really the right way to go. So there's a 50 city tour. If you go to the website, which is simply showherthemoneymovie.com, you can see where the, um, where the movie's going to be uh, shown, where it's going to be screened throughout the country. And that gets updated 
pretty much weekly, if not daily, uh, with all the different places. So we've already been to like uh, San Diego and a couple places in California, Dallas, and we'll be back to some of those places again. We will be in Columbus, Ohio for the Angel Capital Association Summit in May. So lots of different places all over the country. We were just in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, and it's won some you know, awards at different film festivals. And it's just, it's a really cool, um, it's a really cool film and it's a really cool process of how we're rolling it out because at each of the locations, typically after the film is screened, it there's a panel and at least one or two of the people who are associated with the film are there and can talk a little bit about the film. And then we usually get a local entrepreneur or two, or maybe an angel from the uh, local area and then have a conversation about how we can start to make improvements. But the way that we're going to improve this problem is to stop focusing on the fact that women get less than 3% of the funding and start focusing on the successes that they do have and the fact that more and more people can really get involved and, and be a part of this. Yeah, I think, you know, the awareness piece is so important. There's so much that I think people just assume is true, right? And they don't ask questions because they grew up with different stories or different experiences. I just read something the other day, something I just wasn't aware of. Like you couldn't, as a woman, open a bank account in a bank before 1974 without a man signing for it. And I get, you know, I was younger then, but I just didn't know that was a problem, right? And so the whole list of stories and experiences that people have gone through that no one probably knows and just accept it as fact are huge. I just can't even imagine how huge. So I love that you're doing this and starting to get the messaging out. What are you seeing with the people either through the movie or through conversations that you're having of how to help women start to let go of these limiting beliefs that they may have or have grown up around money? So that's an interesting point that you bring up. The biases that are around investing in general, but definitely the biases around investing in women versus men. Um, There was a study done by Donna Kanzi out of Columbia University where she looked at the way that Uh, founders, both male and female, were asked questions during a pitch. And she found that men were asked more promotion-focused questions and women were asked more prevention-focused questions. And that was across the board. Uh, The biases were both men and women asking the questions were doing the same thing. However, if the founder, in this case, the female founders, knew this and they started to answer the questions with promotion-focused answers they would actually get a different result. So in a lot of cases, I think what we really have to do is bring awareness to all of this, to all of the pieces. And maybe then some of those limiting beliefs that women have will start to dissipate. But it's kind of like what I said earlier about the golf course thing. You know, men, that's a good example of men having you know, this, what I call generational networking opportunities. These are things that have just gone on for generations and generations. You know, grandpa knew this person who knew that person. And there's, you know, the country clubs and the uh, alumni associations and all of those things. Women have only really been in the workforce since World War II. We're only now starting to see the metrics change for as, as far as colleges and MBAs and, you know, engineering and things like that. But we're not even close to figuring all that out yet. So we still have a long way to go, but I think we're making some pretty significant progress. And I think that's what will help to to get more awareness and then get more people to get the funding that they need in order to make the innovation that they want to do. Yeah. I mean, just in that small clip on the trailer, just seeing some of those products, what people are creating and inventing is amazing. And you hate for those to not get out into the world because someone you know, didn't believe that they could. Are you seeing imposter syndrome happening throughout these experiences too? Even if they get the capital and they start to move forward, do they experience imposter syndrome around really trying to take this and turn it into a company? I mean, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, yes. Um, But I think that, you know, diversity in general will build 
better companies and better outcomes. So we need diversity of all kinds. We're not just talking about gender or race even. I'm talking about everything from background, education, where you grew up. Your thought process is going to be different with all of the different things that you're exposed to. So that diverse team, I think, is what can really push a company forward. And that could help take that imposter syndrome away from the underrepresented founders that might feel that if they feel that they have the right team that can support them and can really push it forward. Because I've seen some amazing women, amazing people of color making businesses that are just going to, you know, scale and be incredible. I loved the one woman in the, in the trailer who talked about you know, I love money. I love having money. I love giving money to other people. I think that is also important, especially for young girls to hear and women who may not have come from money to understand mm-hmm. that it's okay and welcomed and you should be excited to have money and talk about it. And not. I think that's something that happens is that women may not talk about money where men might. And so there's a bit of a I don't know if I want to call it shame, but there's just this moment where they're like, "Mm, I could talk about that, but somebody might judge me or somebody might say something, right? Right. I don't know. Has that been your experience as well? Yes, uh, absolutely. And in fact, I think as women, we are even more conditioned for that. Oh, well, I shouldn't say how much I money I made or how, you know, what, what I'm going to spend on that or what I, how much my house cost or any, anything that has to do with money, because we look at being judged. If you have too much money, you're judged. If you don't have enough money, you're judged. I mean, there's so much judgment around it, but if we actually talk to each other more about it, we might, have a better understanding of how a lot of these things work. Think of how much money is actually sitting on the sidelines that could be put to work in some way, shape or form. And women who are coming into an amazing amount of wealth over the next 10 or 15 years, you know, we're going to need to make sure that women are getting the same type of opportunities. You know, men, they'll just text each other or they'll just call their broker or whatever they're doing. And women, as women, we kind of feel like, oh no, we have to know everything. We have to make lots of decisions. Well, I worry that our decision-making will take too much time and we're going to actually end up losing out on some, um, you know, potential gains. Oh, that's a great point. And, you know, I was thinking also when, before you started that, it's also impacting people's ability to ask for, you know, increases in salary or ask for more during negotiations of taking a new role. Like, you know, I want, you know, stock, I want bigger bonuses. I, I think that's also been something that held, you know, women back for a long time and probably put them behind in, you know, financial terms for maybe the rest of their lives, right? So I love that there's more people doing that now, anybody I coach, like, if you haven't negotiated, we have to talk because I want to make sure that you're asking for more and not just accepting what someone offers you, which has been the norm for a long time. Okay. So you also have a podcast called The Angel Next Door. Uh, Talk a little bit about that and who you have on the show. Right. So I started it because, um, and as the name implies, The Angel Next Door, I'm trying to show that anybody can be an angel and you could be living next door to somebody, kind of like the millionaire next door concept. And um, the show really has, I try to feature people who have either been an angel investor and how did they get there? So they tell their backstory about how they learned about it. Um, You know, maybe where they got their wealth from or where they, if they are wealthy or where they found out about it and started doing equity crowdfunding. Um, I've also had people on the show that could help to educate angels. So I've had several people come on who were uh, entrepreneurs who raised money on an equity crowdfunding platform so that they could tell the other side of the story so that angels felt more comfortable knowing what was really going on and all the meat and potatoes behind the scenes there. Um, I've had people come on and talk about investing through what is called a donor advised fund, which is a philanthropic fund that anybody can pretty much set up with uh, like a fidelity or something like that. However, these donor advised funds sometimes sit in these accounts for long periods of time and they aren't necessarily used for anything other than maybe they're invested in a mutual fund or something like that. But those funds can be self-directed toward a for-profit company. It can never go back to the donor because the donor's already gotten their tax 
you know, advantages and things like that. And, but, um, it could be like a triple win because the money could be used for good um, for a for-profit, but then the money could also, let's say that there's an exit and there's a gain, that money would go back into the donor advised fund and then could be directed to a 501c3 and there'd be more money than there was before. So these are all you know, very innovative in different ways to look at how you can actually use your money for good. And in a lot of cases, this isn't talked about at all. So I'm trying to bring more awareness to that. And things are happening and changing all the time. I literally just recorded a podcast episode that is about this very topic, but it's a 501c3 um, uh, charity that is doing the actual investing into for-profit companies. It was so fascinating. You'll have to listen to the episode. Uh, Patrice Brickman of Inspire Access and her daughter, Leah Brickman, were on. And it was really, really, really interesting. I was asking like so many questions because I'm like, wait a minute, let me make sure I understand this. Um, But really interesting ways that you can now use philanthropic dollars to help for-profit companies. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Yeah, I think there's so many episodes that you've already had that I think people will really learn from. If you have any resources, you know, at all that I can share in the notes, I would love to do that for people who maybe want to know more about the equity crowdfunding or any of these other things that you've shared today. I think it's, um, you know, they just don't know what they don't know. So if we can raise awareness in any way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everything. You can go to my website, which is just marshadawood.com and you'll see all the things. And there's a link there to the podcast with all the different um Perfect. Okay. Well, we will definitely do that. Okay. Last question before we get into the four questions I ask everyone. What do you want your legacy to be, Marsha? Well, I think um, I think I'm living the legacy right now. <laughs> you know, just trying to get there to be more awareness uh, around this topic, get people to feel more comfortable, and feel that this is something that's doable, approachable. Um, and that they too can make a difference. I used to think that just as one person, you know, what what am I going to be able to do? How am I going to be able to make a difference? But everyone can make a difference in the world of innovation and help with entrepreneurs. And they're all over the place. They're everywhere. And they're coming out of colleges that are doing amazing things. So we just need to be there and support. Yeah. Well, you're definitely uh, doing that for sure through your book, through the movie, through all the things that you're involved in. I think it's definitely going to help conversations get started, right? Where they may not have existed before, which is the first step sometimes, just understanding a little bit more about it. Okay, so we're going to transition into what I call the Rise Up and Be Visible Quick Tips. These are four questions I ask every guest. Uh, The first one, visibility is, if you can fill in the blank and tell me why you think that's the answer. So to me, visibility is being able to be your true self and be able to do the things that you think are going to help make a difference in the world, not just for yourself and your family, but for others. And I think that one of the things that I'm really trying to work on, like we just talked about, is getting people to that comfort level and making people feel like, oh, well, you know, sometimes I don't even like people seeing all the things I've done in my background because they're like, oh, well, I'm not going to be an angel investor and be able to do all that. But it, it it was over a long period of time and it took, you know, and it was like just one thing kind of led to another. But there's a lot of things that people can do and and be able to help with. And that makes them visible for whatever it is that they care about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And that's why I wanted to talk about your background and how people could help even if they don't have that background and and how you didn't have it in the beginning either. <laughs> so you can start from wherever you are and, and learn about it. What are you doing to be visible? Well, I never thought I would write a book. Let's just put it that way. I would much rather have a spreadsheet or some math to do. I'd like to look at some financial statements. I am not what I considered to be a writer, but um, I went to a group with a group called Heroic Public Speaking, which I know you know about, Sue. And from there, met AJ Harper, who is a um, incredible writing coach. And I went through her process of uh, to be able to write the book. And I'm sure I could have written a book with by myself, but I don't think I could write have written this book. 
without AJ. Yes, she's got some magic, doesn't she? (laughs) She really does. I totally agree and understand exactly what you're saying for sure. Uh, What is the best leadership or career advice you've ever received? Uh, I was just talking about this the other day. That's funny. Probably that I needed to take the words I and me out of my vocabulary. This was like, I was really young. I was a brand new manager. And um, my boss just sat me down one day and said, you know what? Um, This isn't about you. So you need to take all those words out of your vocabulary. And you know what? I'm so glad that he did that because I was like, oh, I didn't even realize I was doing that. But he did it at such a critical point in my development where I was still so new um, that it changed the trajectory then of how I managed other people. Yeah, it's a, it's an important lesson. I learned that uh, along the way as well. And, you know, you just don't realize you don't know what you don't know until someone is kind enough to give you some feedback, yeah. which I love that people are doing that. Uh, it's so helpful. Otherwise, you just keep doing, you know, what you're already doing. What is a book you would recommend to the audience to read, learn, listen to? Well, we always have to promote AJ's book. AJ Harper wrote a book called Write a Must Read. So if you're thinking about writing a book, I would definitely um, encourage people to read that and get that book. (laughs) It's an incredible tool. Um, But right now, uh, I really love the book Buoyant by Susie DeVille. You probably know her. And um, she just has some amazing creative ways in order to kind of set yourself free. She wrote the book specifically for entrepreneurs, but it really applies to everyone. And she was actually on my podcast because she talks specifically to entrepreneurs. And it was really an interesting conversation that got quite a bit of um, traction. Yeah, she has been on this show twice. And I agree. I recommend her book. I actually took it to uh, an event I was at last week where they were building a library of books. And I had a copy of hers that I brought with me because I learned so much about just myself. Uh, it didn't matter if I was an entrepreneur or not. Um, and her 5Ms process, I think, is so brilliant uh, and helping people just really work through stuff, get a good system for yourself every day that you can use and start to reflect a little bit more and take some time for that. So... Yeah, I love both of those books. I actually have AJ's book on my counter right now because I'm starting on book two. So I'm referring back to some things that uh, I learned the first time (laughs) I went through the program. So I love that. Anything else you want to share with the audience? Uh, Anything that I didn't ask you about that you want to share? Uh, I don't think so. I think though the, the concept of doing good and doing well is something that people should really be thinking about because... You don't have to just donate to charity, although charities do amazing work. But if we put the burden all on them to solve all the world's problems, that's not fair. So we can do good and in that way by helping some of these for-profit companies, but we can also do well and potentially get not just financial returns, but also emotional returns that can really last Mm -hmm. a lifetime. Yeah, it's making a big difference. I know that what you're doing is going to make a big difference. Um, I can't wait for the, I don't know, I'll have to check and see if the the movie's in my area or not, um, or go find a way to watch it. But I love that you're doing all of these different things to help people learn about this, this thing that maybe many people just are not familiar with and don't know enough about, but it's accessible to them. And I think a lot of people want to do good And so maybe this is a way for them to do that. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Of course. All right. Well, everybody make sure and check out her book. I'm sure she has a pre-link on her website for you to order her book, Do Good While Doing Well. Check out the movie. Um, We'll make sure that we have her website in there so you can find all the information. So thanks so much for joining today on the Visibility Factor podcast. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks so much for listening to the Visibility Factor podcast. Remember that visibility starts with small steps that are intentional and consistent each day. Be bold, be visible, be the leader you were meant to be. Find us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Follow us on all of our social media platforms, which are highlighted in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Visibility Factor podcast.